Hi, Pastor Mike Chandler here. I want to thank you for tuning in and let you know that we have other resources for your spiritual journey on our website. But just a quick reminder before we begin, while resources like this and others can be helpful for growing in the ways God has ordained for you, they are no replacement for gathering with your local church on Sundays. So we do encourage you to use them, but in full participation with your local church. If you're not currently connected somewhere, you're always invited to Grace Point. Visit our website, gracepointstcloud.com for time and location, and we hope to see you soon. This week begins uh, our, our, our Christmas series, our Advent series called Christmas Cards from God, and we're going to be looking uh, over the next several weeks at many hand-picked passages that, that show up uh, into these cards. And, uh, and if you're like me growing up, right, I still remember going to the mailbox. Uh, pulling out fistfuls of, of Christmas cards. And like most kids, what do we do? Rip it open and we do that whole bend it so check or money will fall out. And then we open it and go, who's it from? Cool. And we move on, right? Never read what's on the card. We, we never really care what's on the card. We only care about what's inside the card, right? Um, and that, like I said, I never read one word except for who it was from. But one thing I noticed now is that all these Christmas cards, I mean, as we get older, we start reading things, right? We actually open it up. Oh, it's a nice message, you know? Uh, but one thing now, these cards are riddled with Bible verses and pithy sayings, you know. And even though it feels like an older trend, I know many of us still try to find uh, cards when you're looking for cards with the deeper meaning. And to the point where we end up making our own cards because we know that has the deeper meaning. And so um, for, for many years, when I was looking at cards to give even to ministry leaders, I, I really struggled hard to find cards that said something more than have a warm holiday or took a, a, a Bible verse out of context, and it just, that's not what that means. And so when we talk about Christmas cards from God, over the next several weeks, that's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at many of these one-line Christmas card verses, and we're going to be expanding it out into the larger context about what is the author actually saying, and then how do we glorify Jesus out of what he is saying. And so today's verse is one I've seen in cards many times over the years. And so let's read this together. Titus chapter three, verse four. It says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our savior appeared, he saved us. It feels so good reading that, doesn't it? And anyone who reads that, you can say, well, God is loving and God is good and God is kind. Look, he gave us Jesus, right? We, we can say those things. So, but I, I have a tendency to, to, to read these things in the fuller context. And while those things are true, God is good, God is kind, God is loving. We sell ourselves short when we miss what Paul is actually saying in the full context. Yes, those things are true, but there's so much more. We're gonna go back and we're gonna read this in context. Titus 3, 3 through 7, it says this. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures. Ouch. Passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving, right? Kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Listen, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Christ Jesus, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Changes the narrative a little bit, doesn't it? The verse four is the feel-good message, but it stands in contrast with, with who we are outside of Christ. And so um, you can see it here to the left, but could you imagine if both verses three and four were put in, in, in printed modern language? This is what a, my reformed Christmas card would actually say. Merry Christmas, you foolish, disobedient, passion-enslaved, rage-filled, jealous, egotist, whom is at war with all others. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. I love Christmas movies, and this is the equivalent of Home Alone is my favorite Christmas movie. Uh, this is the equivalent of the first part is Merry Christmas, You Filthy Animal. The second part is better. <laughs> I look at that passage and I go, yes, 
Yes. But when the goodness and loving kindness. Yes. But wow, verse 3 makes me go, I am the worst person ever. And because of my wickedness, he gave me mercy. Because of my sinfulness, he gave me redemption. It stands in contrast. It should say, because you're wicked, you exist no more. Because of your sinfulness, depart from me. But these passages, when we read them, it says, because of what you are and despite of what you are, come close to me. Here's the first point today. Our sin shows our need for a savior. Let's look at verse three again. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves in various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Oh, that's so true of our own hearts. But look at the the first few lines. For we ourselves were once foolish. Were being in the the past tense. This notates the true heart change that happens in, in someone when they come face to face with the glory of God. I've always heard it said that you can never come face to face with the glory of God and not be changed because of it. Now, whether that's gonna put you on your knees or it's going to make you evaluate your heart posture in front of the Lord, that's gonna vary. But what it's gonna do is gonna change you regardless. You know, I think about this, for we ourselves were once foolish. Well, that tells me that outside of Christ, we are still this way. And even in Christ, we have to be killing our sin by the hour because if we don't, we're gonna end up being the wicked people who are saying, well, that once was me when it really just currently is you. And sadly, too many Christians do not think deeply about their sin. We can actually end up ignoring areas of our life that are riddled with it because we are making progress in other areas of our life. Church, on the daily, even as believers, we are disobedient and deceived. We are wicked. We are wretched. We are oh so prideful. We are selfish. We are jealous. This is unfortunately because of the nature of sin. We still fight against this even as believers. But here's the thing, if you don't know Christ, you're blind to these things. And if you do know Christ, remember, we have to be killing sin. There's a Puritan, uh, Owens is his last name. He says, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. And that's just so true as we we look at this. This this verse verse 3 proves to us the exact opposite of what culture is going to teach us. The culture will teach you people are innately good. No, they're not. Left to, left to ourselves, we're not only going to turn to our own sinfulness, but our, our own selfishness, and we're going to enjoy our own sinfulness, and we're not even going to know it. This is like a modern-day Lord of the Flies, right? Left to our own selves, we're going to kill each other for the conch shell because we want to be in charge. We want to have it all together. Here's the sad thing, church. For some of us right now, this sin is so prevalent in our lives. And I know it's almost Christmas and we think everything should be merry and bright, but this is the reality of where we are. What does our sin do? And I love this list. There's a a exposition or a commentary series called Christ Center Exposition. They give us five realities of sin. The first one is this, sin deceives. It convinces us our wickedness is good. It convinces us that God's intention was not to be with his creation. Our sin deceives us and we become blinded to spiritual reality. We are led astray and we're guided in the wrong direction because we're following the wrong path. There's an old pastor of mine that said, sin will take you farther than you want to go and keep you further away than where you want to be. Sin deceives us. It takes everything wicked and turns it on its head and we go, oh, that's not that bad, is it? Here's the second thing. Sin disobeys. 
our natural inclination is to do everything our own way, right? God has a clear path, a clear intention, and we plan so often to rebel against that daily. God, I, I know you said, but my heart's not really in it today. And so since it's not in it today, I'm gonna find every excuse to ignore it and do my own thing. Now, if you're going, that's not me, yes, it is. Because even as someone preaching this to you, that's me. God, you don't really know what you're talking about because you've never been in my shoes and therefore I'm gonna do it my way. And every single time it works out in the worst way. Here's the third thing, our sin dictates. Our sin tells us what to do. Our sin tells us what is good. Our sin tells us what to desire. Our sin enslaves us. It makes us feel as if we are free, but we become slaves to our sin. We are never satisfied and we're constantly trying to feed our minds and our souls with our idols. The desire of sin is to hate what is good and blind us to that reality. And our sin will crumble us. It will take what we call good and hold dear and it'll warp it into something it's never supposed to be. But again, if we're looking at verse three, the amazing news here is that this is a picture of who we once were in Christ, who we no longer should be and who we no longer are in Jesus. Do we still struggle with these things? Absolutely. That's the sin nature within us all. But is that who we are? Is that where our identity lies? Here's the fourth thing, sin detests. I don't know if we have ever really processed that all righteousness is an affront to all of sin. Your own flesh demands to be selfishly fulfilled and actively fights against being controlled. Do you know really how hard it is to control your own body sometimes, your own mind, your own heart, your own emotions, your own... Ugh. There's times where where my, my, my son Trevor, he'll just do something just off the wall. And I'm like, why did you do that? And he's crying, I don't know. And, and to me, I'm like, yes, you do. Yes, you do. And your little wicked heart, you know, tell me why. <laughs> but sometimes, let's be real, I have to put myself in his shoes. And when I do stupid things or when I do sinful things, there's literally parts of me. I'm like, why did I do that? I know better. This is why, like the same idea that Paul writes in, in, in 1 Corinthians 9, he says, I discipline my body and I make it my slave. That's what we need to be. Discipline your body, make it your slave. I've gotten fat over the years, and so I've started working out more. And literally, I'm sometimes yelling in my, my shed, one more, because I'm trying to get my reps out. Because I know a mere moment of pain will produce something better. And even in our own lives, we say a mere moment of withholding from my desire, my flesh will produce something better as long as it's pursuing the Lord. The last thing is sin destroys. I think that's self-explanatory. Your sin will destroy you. You're, I mean, some, some of us, we, we play this game, it's all right, I can manage my sin. Well, <laughs> No, you can't because it will eat you from the inside out. If you truly, if you truly are in Christ, you will never be okay with the parts of sin in your life. Because if I'm looking at verse three, for I once was, and if I still am okay with that list, I have to evaluate my heart and say, well, am I? See, I'm convinced that the good we see in people who are not believers is simply a common grace of God towards mankind. But in sin, like I said, we're controlled by our sin nature with absolutely no hope of overcoming it. You're stuck in your sin. How do you, how do you conquer your own sin? How do you conquer your own wickedness? So many of us, we just try and try and try and try harder and try harder. And every single time we end up in the same place, we're like, well, next time I'll do it different. And then we try, and we try, and we try. Look, even though we know this, it doesn't stop us from trying. So what do we do in response? Well, like I said, we often try to be a better version of ourselves than what we already are. And that's a horrible response. 
It never works because all we do is modify our behavior and we never transform our heart. When Paul writes in Romans, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. We'll fall into the same destructive habits and patterns that got us to the place that we are trying to get out of in the first place. And an example of this, there's a pastor in Raleigh, Durham. His name is J.D. Greer. And he, he equates uh, the, this, this kind of picture of a, to, to a drowning victim. There's, there's only so long you can hold your breath underwater before your body forces yourself to <gasps> breathe in air. Or if you're underwater, you start filling your lungs full of water. There's only so much time you can hold your breath and your body demands that you will <gasps> inhale. And he says, in the same way, you were created to breathe in the glory and the love of God. And when you're no longer doing that, your soul begins to crave other things and you have to breathe something in. And so, as we are in sin, we'll begin to breathe in our idols and our desires and our depravity and our wants. And we become slaves to the things that are not of God. And therefore, we, what we see is people who are, who are actually rejecting God's law, thinking it's going to lead them to freedom. But look, look what God has saved us from. I look at verse 3. I'm like, look at what he saved us from. That and more. That list could go on for miles. And then at this point, we're probably all thinking, well, this is depressing. I thought this was Advent. <laughs> I thought this was supposed to be a fluffy, happy-go-lucky sermon. It is. But you have to understand the wickedness before you celebrate the righteous. You have to understand who you were before you can look at who you are. You have to understand where your sin took you compared to who and what Christ is doing for you and has done for you. So understanding the reality of our sinful condition is the only way we can see the importance of his coming in our new birth. Here's our second point. Jesus' new birth allows our new birth. Because if we're born with sin and we're born with death upon us, the only way out of sin and out of death is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Let's look at verse four. Knowing all of verse three, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior appeared, he saved us, amen. But, it doesn't matter what has happened, what is said, what is thought, what was done. He appeared. He saved us. This is why we celebrate Christmas. That verse, the reality, the birth of our God coming to this earth, becoming a fully God, fully man, baby. This one sentence, church, changes everything. I mean, look, look at the type of person who you were and and look at the life that God has saved you from if you're in Christ. He didn't have to. He chose to. There was no mandate. There was no obligation. Only out of his own goodness and out of his own love and out of his own kindness was he motivated to save humanity. And even in the fullest context, verses three through, four through seven is one long Trinitarian sentence that actually describes how the personhood of God is active in the act of salvation. God, our Savior, through Christ, by works of the Spirit. Because of faith and the obedience of a young betrothed couple, we know that the birth of a baby Jesus physically allows a new birth within us spiritually. His birth marks the beginning of his earthly reign and will ultimately lead to a salvific work on the cross. Isn't it amazing this this morning? We started out singing, Hark the Herald, and ending with how deep the Father's love for us, from manger to the cross to the resurrection. See, I, I read this passage, and it reminds me of the dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus in John chapter 3. See, Nicodemus, he's trying to search out this, this new life, and, that, and, and Jesus offers this life that Jesus offers, and he doesn't realize it's not about what he can do, but it's about how Jesus changes us from the inside out. He's like, you can't come out of your mother again, so you need new birth. How does this happen? For who we once were to who we now are is the radical 
picture of transformational power by the work of Jesus. And, and church, so often we, we still try to do that our own way. We will admit Jesus with the tip of our tongue, but in the core of our heart, we somehow still think, I can figure it out. I'll just say this, for anyone in this room who's hearing that, you know your identities in Christ, I rejoice with you. Looking at who you once were, not looking at who we now are because of the work of Jesus, not again, not by anything we've done, but because of Christ. But for you who sit here and you're sitting on that fence or you just flat out denied Christ, the deity of Christ, the salvation of Christ, in a way my heart breaks for you. Where is your hope? Where is your if this is it, like when you breathe your last breath, that's it. You're a dash between two dates on a gravestone. Nothing more. But if you are in Christ, you have hope of eternity with him. Not, not given over to the reality uh, uh, of sin, but now you are redeemed through the work of Christ, that you will be with him forever. And this is where, like, I try to tell my kids, my kids are like, well, you know, that I love Jesus, but like, heaven's going to be one really long church service. I'm just not looking forward to that. That's not true. Man, we are, we are going to be changed. The, the sinful flesh within us is going to be gone. The beauty of Jesus will be before us. It's not going to be just like, I don't want to be here. It's going to be, I don't want to be anywhere else. And it's not too late to respond to Jesus. It never is. We hold fast to this text, church, and we read, and we see that God is, has not made exemptions of, of who can and cannot come to him. He didn't say, this is who you once were, parentheses, but if you're this person, this person, or this person, it's not open to you. No. It says, this is who you are, enslaved by your own passions, but God being rich in mercy. And like I said, when you come and conf are confronted with the glory of God, you not return chain, uh, unchanged. And again, we realize this. He saved us by his own desire. Like I just say, you and I, church, we had just about as much to do with our own spiritual regeneration. Fill in the blank. And I'll say, if the Spirit of God is moving within your heart and within your life, then respond. Just don't sit there and just, ah, you know, I'm not sure. Is this really for me? Just don't sit there and be like, you know, I'm, I'm good. Andy, I'm good. Are you in Christ? It's the first question I'm gonna ask. Have you put your confession and belief in him? Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus was put to the death and raised from the grave, it says you will be saved. Not you might be saved or you have the chance to be saved. It says you will be saved. And that comes with a heart change. And as we follow Jesus, our, our spiritual lives begin to look less like our past and more like our future life in Christ. It becomes less like being foolish and less like being disobedient and less like being led astray and less like being slaves to our passions and pleasures and more like pursuing the glory of Jesus. And some of us, that terrifies us because we don't want to let go of that. Because you say, well, look at all I have. I'm still blessed. I still have a family. I still have kids. I still have a job. I still fill in the blank, whatever it is. I'm okay. But when we consider things longer than now, we have to understand that there is more to this life than now. One commentator writes, God's goodness and loving kindness moved him to save us. His love moved him to save us. His mercy moved him to save us. His grace moved him to save us. One thing that all Christians will put stock in is that Jesus saved us. And I'll say, church, many people want Jesus on their own terms, and it doesn't work that way. They want half of Jesus, but not the whole Jesus. They want the lucky rabbit foot Jesus, but not the sacrificial Jesus. They want the Jesus that way they can acknowledge and think somehow that they're doing something great or they want the part of Jesus to where they, they can just have feel good about where they are in life and have a little bit of religiosity maybe but they don't want to submit their lives to him 
They don't want to make him Lord over their life. They don't want to give him control because our hearts are wicked and we want to just hold on to any bit of control we have. There's a, a documentary called Free Solo. It's about a, a climber named Alex Honnold that he climbed uh, El Capitan, which is a, the highest um, sheer face granite rock wall in Yosemite National Park, but he climbed it without any ropes. That's us trying to take control of our own lives. Now, hear me. That's an amazing documentary. And I'm looking at it going, like, my, like, my hands are sweaty and I'm, living, I'm in my living room. I'm like, I couldn't imagine. But so often, that, that's, a, that's a picture of us because one wrong move, he's going to tumble to his death. And in that, Alex pretty much says, well, if that happens, I don't want that to happen, but at least... I will die doing something I love. Well, for us, that's kind of the game we play. I'm trying to hold on to all the control or trying to hold on to something I love. And if I fall, I know I'm going to die, but you know, it's a risk I'm willing to take. Are you? Verse four allows us to understand three things. Here's the first one. Jesus comes to make God personal. He's announcing his love for creation here. I mean, look, why do we show up to parties? To be there with someone that we love personally. A card is nice. FaceTime can be nice. But there's something so much better about being there in person. The interaction is different. I mean, has anyone ever been FaceTimed into a party or a wedding or something of the, of the sort? You're watching during COVID, we're all watching things on Zoom. Look to the left. <laughs> Turn the camera to the left. Will they have you on mute or they can't hear you because you're in a big room of people? You can't go where you want to go. You can't see who you want to see. You can't talk to who you want to talk to. You're at the mercy of the person who's on the other line. Look, I really, rem- I rarely remember the last FaceTime I had with grandma, grandpa, you know, our friends Jeff and Tracy, whatever else. I, I don't remember that, but I remember the last time I was with them. I remember the last time that we hung out. I remember the last time that we shared time together because it's etched into your soul. I can tell you almost every nuance of the last visit we had with them. We know presence makes a difference. And in Exodus right now, we're talking, he's a, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. That's presence. Could you imagine if God just completely just said, I'm here, where? He's present. He was present in the burning bush. He's present in the pillars. He's present as he leads Israel. He's present with us through Jesus. His goodness and his kindness goes well beyond a weekly check-in. And it is demanded, he demanded his life for the sake of sinners. See church, God wants his creation to know him, not just as some distant entity, but as someone close and personal and caring, loving as a savior would. There's something about, when I read biographies of generals, I'm a history nerd, so. When I read biographies of history of generals or presidents or whatever it might be, people will rarely tell you, well, this, he did this policy and did this vote. He said that, he said, but they can remember how they felt when he was around. When you read about Abraham Lincoln, People will tell you, well, I, 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 you know, in the history books, I, they don't remember everything that was said, but they remember the presence. The presence of one good commander can change the battlefield. Here's the second thing. Even our most, most difficult times, we are not left alone. You know, I think that's one of, one of my biggest fears in life is being left alone. Like Will Smith did a movie called I Am Legend several years ago, and he's all alone. I'm like, I'd be terrified of that, especially when my dog died. You know, in, in this, like, we're, we're not wondering who this God is and if he's around. We know because others have seen, and we see because others have known. Could you imagine, yes, terrifying, but yet how comforting it is when Jesus comes in and says, I'm here. I'm resurrected. Yeah, touch my side. Touch the nails of my hand. Like, I'd be like, do I, do I want to? 
But at the same time, I'm like, he's here. He's standing before me. He's not some ghost or apparition. I'm not tripping out or anything. He's standing before me. We're not left alone. See, Jesus was tempted just as we are. Jesus suffered as we do, and he faced rejection, mockery, and abuse at a much higher level than we could ever understand, and yet he is still with us. Our God understands everything, everything about humanity and more. Here's the third thing. We are not stuck in our sin because God has made a way. Again, remind yourself that verse three, we once were. These are the things that once identified us, identified us. And if you are not in Christ and if you do not hold fast to Jesus, these are the things that still define you. Still, today, presently, as you sit and breathe, if you are not in Christ, verse three is who you still are. We see clearly in verse five, that God has made a way. He has done so and not by anything you have done by his own mercy. Let's look at verse five. It says, well, we're gonna read verse four into five. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our savior appeared, he saved us. Look, not because of works done by his, by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. We're gonna hold off right there. Not because of our righteousness, because, because quite frankly, we don't have any though some of us are filled with self-righteousness, we think that we're somehow better than the person next to us because you might've done four Christmas boxes instead of three, like that person there. You might've shared the welcome card with the person at work or at the server at the restaurant, but not that person. And all of a sudden we start playing this game where we want to elevate ourselves and be like, well, look how good I am. Whether it's your walk with Christ or whether it's sports or whether it's whatever it is, whatever hobby it is, I've always heard this, there's always someone better. No matter how good you are, there's someone always that can put you in your place. but he saved us, verse five, not because of works done by us in righteousness. Because Paul now is assuming that he's writing to believers because he's saying, this is who you once were, but because of Christ, this is who you now are. And guess what? Now out of this, no matter what you've done for the name of Jesus in your own righteousness, it doesn't matter because it's not about you. It's according to his own mercy. One thing we often miss is that God's way is not dependent on me, on you. It's dependent on Jesus' righteousness. And outside of Christ, we have none. The fact that people cannot save themselves strikes the very core of pride that we all pretend not to have. It strikes at the hearts of the zealous Pharisees who kept the law for their own image. And it strikes the the hearts of us who played a really good type of church. Both on the outside look really good, but on the, on the core, fundamentally, it's rotten. It's self-serving. I remind you that God has made the way you have not. You are the reason, I am a reason, that the way was even needed to begin with. Here's our next point. Our Savior provides a new way for us. Our Savior provides a new way for us. He doesn't fix the old broken way. He provides a brand new way. Just like in St. Cloud, we don't need new old broken roads. We need new roads, traffic, right? We don't need the old fix. We need brand new ways. In the same way for our heart, we don't need something broken fixed. He's gonna give us something brand new. Just like at the end, when there's a new heaven and a new earth, Jesus is not gonna sit there and be like, all right, well, I gotta fix this one. No, he's gonna destroy this one and give us something new. He's not gonna fix our old broken bodies. He's gonna give us something new. Our savior provides a new way for us. See, Paul uses two words showing us how we are transformed by washing of regeneration and by renewal of the spirit. 
Obviously, we know that this washing is not an external washing. It's an internal washing that's never tainted again. It's a permanent internal washing. Like we, we all know, washing externally, and this is why we know he's not talking about that, right? Washing externally only gives us a temporary cleanliness. We may look good, smell good, feel good for a day. For some of you guys, maybe two. <laughs> but we have to do it all over again. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I think about my own kids. Sometimes it's a matter of minutes. <laughs> In Christ, look, this internal washing is one and done. It regenerates you. It takes what is, what is dead and gives you a rebirth into spiritual life and spiritual vitality. The, word, the actual word regeneration is actually found twice in the Bible, but it creates a major Christian doctrine. It's found right here in Titus 3, and it's found again in Matthew 28, where Jesus is talking to the disciples about the perfected creation that is to come. So in the same way, Jesus describes what will ultimately happen to this earth Uh, In Matthew 18, Paul writes, the same thing happens to our hearts. So it's not gonna be anything broken that's fixed. It's gonna be something brand new. Just like within you, it's not gonna be something broken that's fixed. It's gonna be something brand new. We're gonna be renewed and not reborn. We're gonna be new. We're not gonna be fixed and broken of our former selves. We're gonna be completely new. See, this word regeneration actually has a negative and a positive attribute. The negative being you cast off something and the positive being you now adorn something else. If you have a hole in your jacket, Jesus is not gonna walk up with a thread and needle and be like, hey, let me fix that for you. He's gonna say, take that rag off, here's something new. Regeneration is not something that we work up to, but something that is given to you through Jesus. See Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. This won't be on the screen, but you can note this for later. It's a great picture of God's love for his people. He says this, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit inside you. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and you will move to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. See, that's the washing and the renewal that Paul is talking about. One that is strictly and uniquely focused on the glory of God. Not about what you can do, not about your own self-serving religion. It's about what he can do. And if we have salvation through Christ, then we're, then we're constantly in a, uh, in a state of renewal and becoming more like Jesus through the power of the Spirit within us. So that's when we, we talk about that Trinitarian, God our Savior through Christ because of the work of the Spirit. See, through this work, which started in a, in a manger and ended up in a resurrection, we are declared innocent of our sin. And our identity, again, is no longer in that sin, but it's in the saving work of Jesus. And so if we believe that, we know that he saved us, he regenerated us, he renewed us, he justified us, he declared the guilty innocent because of his character. Don't, don't, don't lose the awe of your worship and grandeur of God, church, because it's so easy to get wrapped up and I gotta go to this place and I gotta buy this thing and I gotta bake that cookie and I gotta go buy this ornament and I gotta, gotta put up that tree this time of year. And it's easy to get so forgetful of what's right in front of us, the glory of God. See, the grace of God allows us to see the glory of God and has allowed us to become heirs and partakers in the kingdom of God. I gotta remind you that being in Christ is not just for this life. It's not just something you do for now. This is something that is transformative and something that will drive you into the hopeful eternity in and with Christ. We do so many things for the temporary. I mean, even Apple makes their phones the last a year or two now before you have to buy a new one. That's not Jesus. That's a really terrible example, but it's not Jesus. It's eternal, never ending. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. 
See, church, we look at this, that by the washing of regeneration, renewal of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at verses 6 and 7. Whom he poured out on us richly through Christ Jesus our Savior. Hmm. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Yes. Yes. See, church, we look at this, and I don't want us to forget it. We are washed and we are renewed by the power of the Spirit. Look, whom he poured out on us richly. He wasn't stingy. He gave it to us more in an overflow. A mercy we did not deserve, but that we have obtained because of Jesus. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs. Heirs, church. That means that you partake with him at his table. That means you are a son and a daughter. No rejection. No question. You know, my kids sometimes get upset with me. And as a dad, I have to discipline them. And, you know, it, it starts these conversations of, you don't love me. <laughs> yes, I do. And then when my kids get really worked up, you know, am I still? You know, I'm like, yes, you're my son. Yes, you're my daughter. And you always will be. There's nothing that can take that from you. <laughs> there's, never, there's never a time where I can't say, he's not my son. She's not my daughter. Never. I mean, I can say it, I can verbalize it, but the fact is they are my blood and my DNA. You look at my oldest, he looks just like me. There's, there's no way I can say you're not mine. And in the same way, they cannot look at me and say, you're not my dad because they bear my DNA. And so when we are renewed, when we are changed when we are justified by his grace, we are heirs. We are linked and bonded to him. Do not miss that. We are heirs and partakers in the kingdom of God. Never to be removed, never to be taken away, but to be freely given. So this passage starts out with wickedness and continues with mercy to mankind through the incarnation. It ends with a glorious hope that we have in the resurrection of Jesus. Church, we are no longer a needy people. We are no longer a lost people. What did Jesus say? I came to seek and save that which was lost. We are no longer an unforgiven people trying to make our own way. And if you are in Christ, the grace of God has made you fulfilled, has made you found, has made you forgiven. And so I tell you, outside of the goodness and the mercy of God, there's no way to truly see how our lives once were because we still are that person. This is why, honestly, I believe Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So let us remember the reason why we're going to gather with our families this, in celebration of the next several weeks, let us, let us remember it started by God sending Jesus so that we may know him more and that we might have salvation in him, knowing who we weren't, once were but God, right? But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. So now when you see that Titus 3 passage in your Christmas cards, you'll go, oh yeah, I once was that, but now I'm this. We are broken and we are saved and it's all because of Jesus. I want to leave you with this quote from Paul Tripp. He says this, the grace of the cross is not just grace that forgives and accepts, but grace that also supplies you with everything you need until you are needy no more. That's the hope that we have in Christ. Let's pray. God, we love you. And God, we, we worship you. God, thank you for your goodness. 
God, thank you. As I look at that list, God, I still struggle with so many things on that list. But God, I'm thankful that my identity is not found there, but it's found in Jesus. God, thank you that you have made a way. And as we gather around tables this Advent season, let us not grow weary of following you. Let us not grow weary of pursuing you. Let us not forget the reality of your glory, of your grandeur. Let us not forget who you are. Let us not forget who we once were. God, let us glorify you because of our our identity that is now in you. God, you are worthy and worthy to be praised. What a beautiful name, Jesus, that you have. What a beautiful way that you have saved us. Thank you for your coming birth as we celebrate. Thank you for your death, your burial, your resurrection. Thank you for coming down to be with your creation, that we would understand you, that that we would see your fullness, that we would look at you and have no excuse. God, you are good. You are great and greatly to be praised. Thank you for your salvation. We love you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.